Good morning, church. I'm delighted and happy to stand here in front of you as a believers, those who believe, and not just in a happy end, in a second come of Jesus Christ, which is very soon. Jesus Christ is coming way much sooner than even I or you can even believe. Not only that, he can come to you or to me even today, because tomorrow is not secure. The last time, those who attend our church, the last time I watched us online, we've been talking about the people of Israel who made the request. Nothing wrong to ask God, no? Uh, but they made some, uh, not so, I shouldn't say not so good, very bad request. They asked for a king. We want a king. What, is the, what was the reason? To be uh, like any other nations. And also we base our study on 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, that do not be unequally yoked with unbeliever. What has to do righteousness with unrighteousness? And how the light and darkness can be mingled together. I'm not saying that you should be proud of it, but you really have to apply to yourself 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that you are the royal priesthood. You are chosen generation, the people set apart. That's how God wants to see you. Paul, and not only Paul, wrote the epistles to saints in uh, Rome and other places. Those people who were seen in a sense of separated, they were uh, not mingled with the society. That, that's why today, if you have these difficulties or not difficulties, if you have these experiences, the people do not treat you as normal, I would say, that's okay. It's okay. When people take you as a part of them, that is not okay. It means that you don't make any difference. They don't see the difference in you. They don't see any difference at you. Today we're going to study the book of Timothy, second book of Timothy, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, as Brother Antoine brought to our attention, the scripture reading from verse 7. But before that, I would like to take you to meditate upon the things that you experience is experiencing every single day. You meet people, you face some things, you see some things you're buying, and your first impression, wow, it's so gorgeous. He's so nice person. She's so good to me. And you kind of formulate the first impression about the person. Someone says you will never be able to make us first impression again is only once if you meet someone yes of course that's the way how the system works how our psychological view we making up we formulated our opinion we're formulating our opinion about the scriptures about the bible about the uh, about this truth i personally been a witness for many people who said, well, that's the church that I was looking for all my life. Finally, I'm here. Guess what? After when we went in the study more, they say, no, it's too much for me. I haven't thought that would be that much. It looks nice. It looks nice. Nice goal. But there is a, something in between. Daily life that you have to reach that goal by keeping up this faith. Exactly what uh, the Paul making this final statement. Uh, in the book of Revelation, in an address to the churches, chapter 2, uh, verse 4, is talking to the first church, Ephesus, and which this church have many good things. But verse 4 says, Nevertheless, I have something what against thee, because thou hast left, what? First thy first love. I'm going to ask you a question before I go in the, in the, in the, in the scripture and the reading. The first time that you have experience with Jesus Christ, and you was impressed with the truth, you accepted the message, what changed since that time? 
What was happening? What was happening on the way until today? What is it? Uh, March 11, 2017. And that day, X day. I don't know what day that you come to a realization. That's what I need for my salvation. This is the only way. And you accept it. You say, I will. Let me ask you another question. What was the, what is the difference between the day of your baptism and now when you pledge to serve God? Is it growing? Is it going up or going down or so, so or up and down? This very personal question. I want you to keep them in mind as we go through this study today. In book of Isaiah, book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 13 and 14. Open with me, please. Isaiah 42, verse 13 and 14. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He will cry, e roar. He shall prevail against his enemy. Verse 14. I have long time hold at my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. The God stopped talking to Israel for 400 years. 400 years was not direct communication to so-called inheritance. Although they still were in a number of God's loved ones. God still considered them as a people of Israel. As his people. For 400 years, God didn't talk to them. Now, only when Jesus Christ came back again, that conversation took over again, took place. For 400 years. And God says, I'm not going to hold peace, my, my peace anymore. For now, my dear brothers and sisters. God is sort of quiet. He is not intervening directly in your life and in this world yet. But when he's going to do this, what verse 14 says, I have long time hold my peace. I have been still and refrain myself. God kind of hold himself back. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. Right in the front of your bulletin, there is a, a small print. It's taking quotes from Spirit Prophecy, NL, page 60, paragraph 6. The Christian life is a battle and march. It is a warfare where there is no release. The effort must be continuous and persevering. The, mark these two words. Continuing and persevering. It is by unceasing endeavor. That we maintain the victory over temptations of, of Satan. Christian integrity is another word to keep in mind. Must be sought with a resistless energy and maintained with a resolute fixedness of purpose. In other words, you don't have to wave. What you know what the James says about the uh, unstable man, no? Double-minded man. He is not good for, he is, he is good for nothing. Continuing, no one will be born upward without stern, again, the same word, persevering effort in his own behalf. All must engage in this warfare for themselves. No one else can fight our battle. If we just read this statement and understand, we can go home today. Brethren, you got to have your own Calvary. Nobody else can go. It's like nobody can eat for you. You got to eat for yourself in order to get strength. The difference between first and following impressions, we will be very disappointed when we realize that we are coming to church in vain. If we don't have that persistency, if you're not continuing grace, if you're not growing, if you're not learning, if you're not practice what you learn, 
What is the point? You might impress me, each other, your neighbors, who knows that you are going to church, your family, but God mark that box empty. Weighed it on a balance and found wanted. This is a big, big problem for every single person who is sitting here. Anything what we're doing in vain puts us down. Since we came here, let's do everything possible to be benefited from coming here. Okay? Not just make a mark. Oh, I was there. And remember, the word of God has a power. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Whoever was speaking today, God just use you. God is using me. Just pray that I would not bring any selfish ideas here that you can hear directly the word from him. Whoever is coming here. I want you to take in a journey in one story. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. It's a long story, but I'll just make a summary of it for sake of time because we have many things to cover. John chapter 6, verse 5, all the way through 14. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that this may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. And I believe Philip was right. It was too many people, it was not feasible to feed them. So the problem is big, and here you are. Andrew is coming with a kind of suggestion, solution. Uh, he said there is a lad here which had five bar uh, barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? So like, we do have, but that is not enough. And I'll skip the rest of the verses. You know what Jesus did? He asked them to organize, to sit them down, and fed them, and they had enough even to collect it after all. I wanted to read verse 14 with you. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. Were they impressed with this? What do you think? Very much. Very much. That is the one. That is the one. And they cheer and they were so, so, so happy. Let's just move in time. When Jesus was about to finish his journey, he was in front of the pilot. Luke chapter 23, verse 20. Same people, maybe a little bit older. They had many experiences with Jesus. At least they heard what he was doing. It was not just one miracle. That, 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 that one may be when they participated exactly, but there are many that they heard about it. Luke chapter 23, verses 20 through 22. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Same people who said, There must be a prophet. That, that's the one whom we, we, we've been waiting for a long time. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What? Why? What evil had he done? I have found no cause of that in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they say again, crucify him. <clears throat> so people changed their opinion, as you see. They were impressed. They loved. They, they had some pleasure to have company with him. 
And when they come to a decision whom they should to choose, they say about him must be crucified. Let's go a little bit harder. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17, gives us a beautiful, beautiful illustration how Jesus Christ was coming to his baptism. And there was a man by name John who baptized people by the Jordan or in the Jordan. Then verse 13, I'm reading from Matthew 3, verse 13. Then coming Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered, said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered. Verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3. Verse 13 through 17. Everything is okay here. No question. No. My question is only one. Did John heard it? Did John hear what, what, what God was saying? He was a witness. He performed the act of baptism. And everything was clear to him. There was no doubt who Jesus was. Before even he said, oh, I, I cannot untie his shoes and so forth. He made several statements, not only one statement, that he acknowledged that Jesus Christ was the God, was God who is coming to save the world. Now, let me take you to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. The scenario has changed completely. The John is in prison now. <coughs> He's very desperate. His disciples left him. Well, not all, some. But they're still bringing him reports. We know why he get in jail. That's not our subject today to study. And uh, verse 2. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Are we not sometimes like John the Baptist had such a great evidence in front of us? We had a personal experiences, not only once, and still doubt comes to my mind, to our mind. For those who have this problem, I really recommend you to read book Steps to Christ about the doubt. It says one quote there, that God will never take doubt away from you. It's still going to be present there. And you got to deal with it. You have to deal with that. God cannot just erase completely from your memory. And you're going to be just uh, programmed for positive. No, 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 no. You got to face it. And I'll just keep this in mind. Uh, I'll, I'd like to take you a little bit back. When David came to see his brothers. And there was a man by name... Goliath, who was coming out every single day, day and uh, defiled Israel and spoke bad words about that and many other things he had done. And David was so, not just upset, he said, what's going on? The God's name down on the ground and this uncircumcised Philistine doing this. I'm going to go and take him down. For 40 days. Every single day. The army was demoralized. Until someone. Faced it. My dear brothers and sisters. Those who hear. Those who are watching us. Your problem never go away. Until you face it. And deal it. And bring to the feet of Jesus. I don't know what you going through. It might be some addiction. It might be your appetite. Love of dress. Love of company. Love of music. Love of things. 
spending or working too much. I don't know what, but you got to face it and bring it to the feet of Jesus in order to overcome it. And then we'll go come to that later. You can say with Paul, I run the race. I finished the race. I have done. I won the race. I was not just participating. I was the one who won the race. Other than that, you would be just in the book's name, maybe. I mean, in the, your name can be in the books of church somewhere else. People might know that you are attending this church. But that's all. It's nothing going to affect your salvation. Because when God will speak, remember that verse from Isaiah? God says, I will speak. I will speak up. I will not hold my peace anymore. Going back to John. Going back to John. What was the answer of Jesus uh, to them, to these people? Jesus didn't say like we sometimes speaking to our children or to each other. Come on. Did you see that? How could you forget what happened? The God, my father, spoke to you directly. You heard from heaven. How come? No, Jesus didn't say, didn't use this uh, horrible technique, I would say, to rebuke people. Listen what he says. So gentle, so nice. This is our God who loves us. And he wants to rebuke us. But Matthew 11, verses 2 through 6. Matthew 11, I'm reading verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto him, unto them, because there was not only one, more than one. We don't know how many. Go and show John those things which he do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and lepers are cleansed, and the deaf her hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And verse 6, the key verse. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. There was a, such a nice rebuke. You know, when you rebuke someone with a nice words, people thankful to them. If you rebu rebuke them with the stern words, Abusive words. Nobody's going to accept that kind of review. You just broke the rela break the relationship. One more and we'll go to next subject. Nicodemus, John 3. Very famous conversation. Nicodemus, John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Nice introduction, no? But in reality, something else was behind all of that. Jesus saw that, he knew that, and he stopped him right there. He said, you must be born again. And that, he came by night, by the way, he was kind of hiding himself. And the uh, Bible does not say anything that he was somehow active or talking more to Jesus during his mission for three and a half years. But look what happened then. Uh, John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Verses 39 and 40. When Jesus died on the cross... And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of mirth and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and found wound in a linen cloth with the spices, as the manner of Jews is to bear. Nicodemus. Who had a chance to spend time with God. This privacy, oh, he was so regretting for, for wasting the time and opportunity. And he had a chance now just to come to the dead body. Not leaving Jesus anymore. The opportunity that we have 
we should really, really, really use it. First and following impression. What is going to happen with you and me between first impression and life of repentance? There's two kind of attitude. I can be impressed, but if I'm not using this anymore, if I stop just there, it doesn't make any sense to me. Disciples of Jesus ask him a question in Mark chapter 10, verses 28 and 30 through 30. Peter began to say to him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses, brethren, and sisters, mothers, and children, and lands with um, persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. There is a promise. Jesus, he is rich. He is not a poor. He is offering us a deal. And we should trust his word. In Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3, we are bound to thanks God always for you, Paul writes, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Paul is talking about the progress not to sit back and relax. Let's go to our main passage, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept my faith. Henceforth there is a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Not only, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. Such a wonderful statement Paul made on the end of his journey. He knew that he is going to die. And looking back with satisfaction, with a so great assurance, he was able to say, I live my life not in vain. I've done it. I invested. And I grew in that investment. And reward is guarantee. Many banks promise you big interest and so forth. Investors. Many times doesn't go true. But Jesus Christ says, if you invest in me, you're going to have the same result as Paul did. The Christian's life is often described as a conflict of war. We are in constant war. Do you know that? We, we have, the, the Satan declares us a war. Actually, we were on a Satan side. And once we step on the side of Jesus, because by birth, you are um, born in sin, with sin. And so once you conscientiously choose to move on the side of Jesus, you become enemy with Satan. But before you do that, you're enemy with God. That's how it works. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'll read from verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Verse 11. Put on whole armor of God, and you, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Who is our adversary? He's, he, Satan himself. He's using different people. He's using my friends, relatives, family members, my boss, whoever is around me to irritate me that I would lose my salvation by wrong expression, losing temper, and many other things. And next verse 13, therefore take up the whole, whole what? Armor of whom? Of God. Don't use your own techniques. Is that it? It will not will not work. That you may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day, and having done all to stand. In other words, he's saying, if you would use God's methods, use His armor, you your victory is guaranteed. Your victory is guaranteed. And he goes on. He said. Having girded your waist with truth. First, you have to really know, kind of tie up yourself, your belt, and keep strong. You can lift up the heavy stuff once you uh, have a good belt around you. Having put on breastplate of righteousness. You got to protect your more sensitive part, your heart, with the, not your own righteousness, with the, his one. Having shoot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You got to go. You cannot stay and in, just enjoy or relax. And shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And also he suggests to protect our head with a helmet of salvation. And finally... To have what? You not just have to defend yourself. You got to. You you, you have to not to be in, in, in defense. In offense as well. You got to have your sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. Very good. Very good. Okay. I'm glad that we know these verses. And will help us to implement them. Anytime when you're facing it. Paul could look back, as we said earlier, over his life with satisfaction. First Timothy chapter 12, I think Christ Jesus, our Lord, who had enabled me for that, he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. It's Paul expressing in First Timothy. I'll give you a chapter reference later. First Timothy chapter one. But I wanted to move all the way to verse 16, 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abound, abounded with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinner of whom? If we can replace Paul's name with us, that would be perfect. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show for all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He said, look, God found me and he bestowed his grace upon me. And uh, I wish people use me as a pattern, as, 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 a, as an example, how to reach salvation. Can we say that with Paul? I wish people look at me and, and uh, do what I do in order to be accepted by God. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14, one of my fa favorite passages, talking about the perfection ongoing process Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 through 14 note that I have already attained or am already perfected but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold on me and verse 13 a key verse brethren I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do 
forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward the goal, toward the goal for the price of that, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Such a wonderful, wonderful assurance. We will at last and be able to look back at the fight as a well done. Having received, received the mercy of Jesus, mercy Jesus offers for our sins if we accept it. Having fought the good fight of faith, laying hold on eternal life. We talk in our Sabbath school about the goals, that Abraham had a higher goal to reach um, that communion with the Lord and he has in his mind the God preparing for him better city and that's why he was doing all those things. So do we. We are not different. We talked about that also. The salvation is not way di not different for Abraham or for us. Same, same principle. Same principle. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 2. Fight the good fight of faith. Laid hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The Timothy was a young man. His mom was uh, Jew and um, her father was Greek. And he was one of the disciples of Paul. And Paul really wrote him this encouraging words. I believe we can share same thing. And the uh, second point in, in verse 4 in verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he said, I have fought a good foot. I have finished the race. Paul compared Christian life with, uh, to run the race. First, first Corinthians 9, 24, 26. And uh, he is bringing up to our attention that there were races or marathons run in a Greek and other countries surrounding there. Verse 26 only, I will read there for, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. So, you know, the Christian, Christian race is not a sprint distance. Do you understand the uh, difference between sprint and marathon? A sprint is a short distance. You got to use all your energy, run whatever, 100 yards, 100 meters, and you're done. Uh, for marathon, you have to have that endurance to finish the race, to start and finish. It. As m many times I mentioned this, it's not that difficult to start. We have emotion, we're impressed, we like it, people welcome us, and we kind of fill in. And after when the routine begins, when all these emotions cools down when daily work we have to do. Then the problem begins. Imagine Noah. Noah who had the call from God to build the ark. And um, it took him 120 years to build. Much longer than our lifespan. Huh? And he not just uh, prepared the material. He... He did impossible, to our understanding, to any human being. He did almost impossible if he would do on his own. But God encouraged him not just to bring the material, to make the blueprint and to start it, to process and finish the work. That, that, was, that was it. That was it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, 34. We also, since we have, we are surrounded by so great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. But that's not all. He didn't finish his thought. This next one, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author, and what else important? Finisher of our faith. He is the one who is going to finish, not you. Who, for the joy of, was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. That's That's what... That's what he uh, required today. Paul could look back over his life with contentment. He had run the race to win with certainty. He didn't doubt or 
somehow, maybe I will be among the winners. No, he said, I will. And he did. Uh, and third part of this verse 7 says, I, ha I have kept the faith. It's important part two. It's very important. Uh, first, second Timothy chapter four, verse seven. I just read the last part. First Timothy one eleven says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Apostle Paul opens his salutation to Timothy. And he says, according to glorious gospel, he, he is talking, he's talking about the gospel. He said, gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust he had maintained the faithfulness uh, to jesus despite great suffering second timothy 1 12 for this reason also i suffered these things nevertheless i am not ashamed for i know whom i believe and i am persuaded that he is able to keep what i have committed to him until that Day. We're going to sing this closing hymn, and I am persuaded, for he is able. He is able, and he is willing, my dear brothers and sisters, to accomplish our salvation, not just to, to start it. And finally, he's, in verse 8, he's talking about the crown of righteousness. The crown, the crown in, in Greek word is, has a very interesting name. The crown in Greek called Stephanos. If you have someone named Stephan or Stephanie, uh, in English, that would be a crown. If you didn't know, today you do. He said, finally, there is a laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, <laughs> and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearance. Going back to First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 20, twenty-four, he says, "Do you know? Do you not know that those who run in race all run, but once receive the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Don't try. Be certain. Be sure. Be sure." James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, when you, uh, when you look watching these Olympic games, they have like golden medal, uh, silver and bronze. In the Bible, we don't have any, any such a division or greats winner only and winner not only one single person anyone can be a winner this is the beauty of it anyone no one is kind of limited i have this from desire of ages uh, page four uh, 549 the one who stands nearest to christ will be he who on earth has drunk more deeply of the spirit of self-sacrificing love. A love that won't it not itself, is not puffed up, seeking not her own, is not easily provoked. Think it, no evil. First Corinthians 13, 4, 5. Uh, the point is, the one who stand near to Christ would be those who dedicate themselves completely and had any have no any selfish reason to believe otherwise. Again, four eight, second Timothy, I want this really to be engraved in our mind and our heart, which the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, to all who loved his appearance. And uh, I'll skip this one. You can take a, those who take a reference. Acts 17, 30 to 31. Paul is talking about the rewards, about the crown that Christ will give to every single one who will endure to the end. 
2 Timothy 4, 1, I charge you therefore before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and dead at his appearing, appearing and his kingdom. Uh, we do know that there is going to be a time, the most important appointment of your life. I don't know. I do know the people are very frustrated to go to for interview, for job interview, um, some go for citizenship interview, and uh, they 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 are very concerned about what they're gonna say, how they're gonna. They first they concern about the dress, dress code, has to be neat, nice, and what they're gonna say. They go through and kind of make themselves ready for it. But the time, the moment that we're talking here, the most important uh, appointment in your life when you're gonna face the our great Redeemer and our great Judge for a final time. It says, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one will receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And I'd like to finish today with the reading on the back of your bulletin here grab your bulletins please the love of the savior was the undying motive that uphold him talking about the paul in his conflicts with the self and in his struggles against evil as in the service of christ he pressed forward against the unfriendliness of the world and the opposition of his enemy. What the church needs in these days of peril is an army of workers who, like Paul, have educated themselves for what? Usefulness. Who have a deep experience in the things of God and who are filled with earnestness and zeal. Sanctify self sacrificing men are needed men who will not shun trials and responsibility men who are brave and true men in whose heart christ is formed the hope of glory and who with lips touched with holy fire will preach the word i believe it's more than clear it says here educate themselves for unselfish who have deep experience in the things of god we have many skills, some of us good in fixing the cars, programming, building, cleaning, I don't know what. But what is the main education should be? Experience in the things of God. And everything else, as we said today, would be added unto you. We should shy for respons from responsibility. It kind of reminds me of business meeting when we're looking for a department's letter and I can't. It's not enough grace for you or what? Why you can't? It's a big question. Going all the way down to the page. Like a trumpet peals his voice has rung out through all the ages since, nerving with his own courage thousands of witnesses for Christ and wakening in thousands of sorrow-stricken hearts, the echo of his own triumphant joy. I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I am finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me a dead day and not only to me only but unto all men also that love his appearing may god bless us deeply with the understanding that we're going through this life just once and the result would be crucial not just for time being for eternity take this bulletin with you read it at home the one is up front the, our life is a war ongoing war and read what is inside, and go over these passages. May God bless you all.
Amen.